to Labor Lens. I am Sharon Ijasson. On this week's edition of the program, we will be discussing about the national minimum wage and what it means to an average Nigerian worker. We would also be discussing about the proposed attempt to remove the national minimum wage from the exclusive list to the concurrent list. We will be right back. Sections 173, subsection 3, and 210, subsection 3 of the 1999 Constitution as amended stipulate that pensions shall be reviewed every five years, or together with the salary reviews of workers, whichever comes earlier. The pensioners are disturbed that the last review happened in 2010. Since the last amendment to the National Minimum Wage Act, Senior citizens under the umbrella of the Nigeria Union of Pensioners have conversed repeatedly for minimum pensions in line with the nation's economic realities. They have at different times called for the implementation of consequential adjustments of pensions following the commencement of 30,000 Naira minimum wage in April 2019. Thank you, Mr. President. And after their cries for two years running have fallen in deaf ears, they say their patience has run out and they have given the government 21 days to redress the situation. Having exhausted all avenues to press home our legitimate demand, but to no avail, we are left with no option than to embark on a nationwide protest, as that is the only language our governments in this country understand. The union also disagrees with moves by the National Assembly to empower states to determine workers' salaries. The way the state governments are treating pensioners, we cannot agree on this issue of making a minimum uh, wage to be on the concurrent list. They will bastardize it. Former staff of the Power Holding Company of Nigeria PHCN have staged a protest to express concerns over government's failure to pay their entitlement since 2000. In an interview with some of the retired workers, these former critical players in the electricity sector are worried that accessing the entitlement ranging from the approved 42% gratuity in 2000 and 23% increment, among others, remains a big challenge. We want the president to help us. Uh, we, we have all that, these other arrangements, that's the money, uh, the, the, apart from the year 2000 retirees, uh, difference of 42%, that affected our gratuity payment as well as the monthly pension that we have received up to date. We have the position of this harmonization of uh, pre-2003 retirees. That is, those of us that retired before 2003 are qualified to receive that to have that uh, to have our salaries harmonized. But that has not happened. The monetization has to do with those who retired post 20, 20, uh, 2004. Those are the people that qualify for the monetization and the uh, electricity rebate. We were in, when we were in service, we were receiving this electricity rebate, that is, some amount of money for the electricity we use in our different homes. We have some percentage that is uh, due to us. Now, when we left, the same thing still applies to us as pensioners. But all of a sudden, in 2012, somebody just decided to remove that money from the payroll I don't know what that person is doing with the money. Up to this moment, that money is still being held up. Even there's been some increment because that's the arrangement that any time the, the electricity rebate for those in service are increased, is increased, then those of us that are pensioners too will have the commensurate percentage increment in our home too. But uh, uh, as, as, as it is now, we are left with nothing. This money they are saying we are not qualified. Has been sent erroneously to Nemco office. Our pension, 33%, have been sent to Nemco office with the arrears. Our harmonization 
has been sent to NEMCO office with arrears. All our accrued benefit has been sent to NEMCO office with arrears. And we have been denied of our entitlement. We deconnive because after thorough interview or investigation by the NAMS, with the authority that connected with the payment, like NEMCO, the then MD of NEMCO told them vertically that NEMCO had done his own part, that NEMCO did not embezzle any pensioners' money. Say the problem is within Peter and our union leader, that NEMCO has calculated everything necessary to be calculated, and he has forwarded it for the Peter for unwanted payment, but it will not know why as at now that Peter has not effected the payment. At this junction, I'm st we are still saying it emphatically here, that we are giving Peter two weeks to start implementing all these payments, all these payments inclusive 33 percent. Implement 33 and give us our deal. 2,000 retirees for more than 20 years now. This money has been paid. 2,000 retirees, yes. The retired workers want their demands met, which are 33% award implementation and arrears, harmonization arrears, monetization of 2,000, retired workers arrears, electricity rebates, implementation, and arrears. Another battle for organized labor looms as the House of Representatives move to empower states to pay their workers according to their financial capacity. Many years of struggle by organized labor led to the enactment of the minimum wage law. The law, which is to be reviewed every five years, stipulates a form benchmark as minimum wage to be paid by state and the federal government to workers. Prolonged agitation by labor movement in the country led to increase in the minimum wage from 18,000 naira to 30,000 naira by the Buari administration in April 2019. Recently, the House of Representatives began moves to amend the law aimed at giving states the power to negotiate and determine what they can pay to their workers. There does not appear any propriety in the federal government imposing the national minimum wage when the resources available to the federal government are at variance with those available to the state government or each state. Reacting to the development, human rights activist and pro-labor lawyer Femi Aborishade says the move is ill-timed and against the laws of the land. I support organized labor to resist the attempt by the ruling class of the two major political parties, the APC and the PDP, to decentralize national minimum wage in Nigeria. I support them. After its National Executive Committee neck meeting in Abuja, the Nigerian Labour Congress NLC decided to hold mass protests across the country over the move by the lawmakers. Some activists are concerned that about 18 states are yet to commence payment of the 30,000 naira minimum wage about two years after it was signed into law. Spokesperson of the Campaign for Workers' Democratic Rights is of the view that organized labor has to be more proactive. What we have in Nigeria is not a sane system. It's a very insane capitalist system which can only survive on the blood and sweat you know, of workers. And the unfortunate thing is that you have labor leaders you know, who are not relating and connecting the struggles you know, against the attacks on workers you know, with the need you know, to mobilize and organize you know, for, to, for workers to take power and ensure that the system of capitalism is banished and replaced by a socialist economic system. Without that, you know, it means that these problems you know, will continue almost ad definito. And that's why, even at this stage, while we are talking about uh, the minimum wage, for workers in the private sector, they will tell you that they can't even begin to talk about minimum wage. You know, what we need now are policies, programs, and legislation that uplift you know, workers' conditions. But this will not happen without a labor movement that is ready to fight and fight without compromise. And also, it will not happen without a revolutionary overthrow of the existing capitalist system. 
It will be recalled that the national minimum wage is a global standard adopted by the International Labour Organization, ILO, through Convention 26, which was ratified by Nigeria on the 16th of June, 1961. On the profile interview segment this week, I will be speaking with the Vice President, Industrial All Global Union, Comrade Issa Aremu. Thank you for joining us on the program. Good day, Sharon, and uh, good day to our listeners and our viewers. There are several challenges that an average Nigerian worker is faced with at the moment, um, but recently the National Assembly um, requested that um, the bill um, that has to do with the national minimum which we moved from exclusive list to concurrent list. At this point in time, what would you think would have prompted the National Assembly to um, bring this bill up again, uh, which has killed um, second reading? Yeah, I think precisely because uh, the bill has not gone through the normal process of openness, transparency, and of course, uh, participation of the citizens, the way normal important bills uh, are normally treated. Precisely because of this opaque manner, uh, non-transparent manner the bill is being pushed, the more reason why we need to uh, condemn that bill, because labor issues are open issues. So if the intention of the bill is to promote public welfare, to promote good governance, then it should be done in the open arena to have the benefits of the input of all the stakeholders. So I want to say that this bill already should be seen to be dead on arrival because of its lack of uh, because of its inability to follow the normal traditions that follow important bills, uh, like other previous labor bills, even like industry, I mean, a petroleum industry bill, which you know we had public hearings and a lot of input. Then the second one, Sharon, is that for those who are knowledgeable about labor matters, today, all the key important factors of production, namely land, labor, and capital, they are on the exclusive list of 1999 constitution. And only the executive branch can make an amend on, 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 on laws guiding land utilization, guiding money, guiding labor. So I also want to say that a private member bill is, is an abnormality to amend national minimum wage. The spirit of the constitution is that any thing dealing with labor issues have to be on the exclusive list. Secondly, with minimum wage, it's always the bill presented by the executive. It's, it goes beyond if not even the parliament can, can, can propose a bill on that. Parliament can ratify proposal coming from the executive. So, if from the point of view of constitution, I think it's also an exercise in constitutional futility. You know, and I think the honourable uh, rep, you know, uh, who's proposing this bill, it needs to improve on its knowledge about labour market issues with respect to minimum wage. Then, thirdly. Sharon, I also think that the challenge of this bill shows that we need to improve the knowledge of those who are ruling us, who are representing us uh, at the National Assembly, those who are elected at the executive, we have to improve their knowledge about labor market issues. The national minimum wage is what it is. It's the national minimum wage and Nigeria Labor Congress has explained this extensively. It is the wage below which no worker should earn. And currently it's 30,000. Before then it was 18,000. 
the, this last exercise, when President Mohamed Buhari commendably set the committee in motion, the tripartite committee, you know, to deliberate on the new minimum wage, for the first time, the governors were calling, not just through the governors forum, almost seven governors were involved in that negotiation. Which takes us to the importance of, um, of the minimum wage. Now that it has um, scaled through the second reading, what, um, what implications do you foresee um, if this is probably signed into law or it receives the presidential assent? No, I, first I know that, uh, um, I know that the National Assembly headed by two notable patriots, uh, the senior president, uh, as well as the speaker of the house, Honorable Bajabi Amila, you know, I know that they will not allow this bill to pass beyond the second reading. What I mean about that is that they don't need to present it to the president at all, given the fact that we have shown, the organized labor has shown that NSC and TUS have shown that the bill was still informed. It was not meant to promote industrial money. It was not meant to facilitate productivity. You know, wait, state governors or state government are at liberty to pay more than the minimum wage if they want to, but they can't pay below that. In um, the 21st century, would you say that um, there's a correlation between decent work and um, national, having a national minimum wage, especially for a developing country or an underdeveloped country like Nigeria? One way to define decent work is that it has to be work that is rewarding for the worker in terms of pay. And a decent work is the work that is entitled to minimum wage, is entitled to living wage, as the case may be. So if you uh, try to lower the minimum wage, you're actually promoting a precarious work, you know, exploitative work, which is completely wrong. And it's not just for developing or developed countries. Wait, Joe Biden has just been uh, inaugurated as the president of the United States of America. One of the key policy issues that Joe Biden is driving for America economy to come out of the, the crisis caused by COVID-19 uh, pandemic is the new minimum wage. He has proposed a bill now to raise the minimum wage from uh, $10.5 uh, 10 uh, to $15 per hour, per hour. Which means if you multiply that $15, if that bill becomes a reality, times uh, eight, that's $120 for a day. The, the current minimum wage that we are talking of now, uh, Sharon, is about $65 per month, which means a worker in the United States will earn twice what a, work, a worker we earn. We have twice what the worker we are just within a day. You have twice what the worker we are within a month in Nigeria. To answer your question, point blank, the key element in decent work is to ensure that uh, you guarantee living with not slave, not slave, uh, slave, uh, slave wage. So at this point, uh, what strategies do you think should be put in place to ensure that uh, workers' rights are protected? Honestly speaking, uh, Nigeria has one of the best progressive labor laws. Now, if the strategies to protect the right, then we need more education of all the stakeholders. You know, and we have to make sure that we promote the best practices uh, and uh, labor has to be more up and doing to do that engagement so that we are more proactive. We don't need to be defensive. And they must prioritize their spending very well to make sure that they face the challenges of governance. We can't combine this physical insecurity with another social insecurity, economic insecurity. Is this trend of some state governments who decide to pay half salaries to their workers, or, and we also have some that I even um, have this perpetual behavior of not even um, paying um, retirees what is due to them after retirement. How would you react to this? Well, as vice president of Industrial or Global Union, we have defined. Uh, I can tell you that our Global Union has defined any attempt to reduce the pay of the working people as wage theft. 
if you don't pay full salary, it's wage theft. And like any 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 act of uh, thievery, it's criminal. It is the job of the workers in those sectors to make the point that whoever pays half salary, you get a half job. If you, if, you, if you don't pay at all, you don't even get services there and it's protected by our law, no worker should work a day longer. For employers that do not pay full salary or for employers that pay half of salary, they have the right not to work for them and or their unions must protect them. We are already talking of crisis of getting living wage. And then the, the miserable minimum wage you have, you are already paying off. It's so not it's criminal. And according to the Minimum Wage Act of uh, 2018, it's actually punishable, you know, both by fine, including jail, for employers that refuse to pay full minimum wage. The governors have to know that they wear two caps. They are not just employer of their workforce. They are also government who should enforce implementation of labor laws. So if the governor doesn't pay, what would be the moral authority of the governor to tell India company, Chinese company, multinational corporations, if there's minimum pay, there must be minimum productivity. If there's a living wage, there must be uh, commensurate productivity so that enterprise can run. So, but you have no moral authority to say workers should be productive where you haven't paid them very well. Mm. So finally, I would like to ask you um, about what your reaction will be in your capacity as Vice President Industrial Global Union. Recently, one of our own, Dr. Ngozi Kunjuela, was appointed as, uh, to man the uh, World Trade Organization. What does this mean to labor as uh, a sector? Let me congratulate uh, Our Excellency, the first female the first African Director General of World Trade Organization, WTO. Uh, and she's the seventh Director General of World Trade Organization. Beyond the issue of gender, I think uh, Mrs. Ngozi Wella deserved the appointment. She earned it a woman with multiple degrees. I listened to her acceptance speech. Dr. Ngozi accepted that trade is important to promote employment, growth, and development. And she even talked of decent work. Her appointment or election, very, very timely, because it's also coming at a time that the African Continental Trade Agreement, you know, the after has become a reality. So this is the best beautiful period for Africa to take advantage of international trade. And I think Dr. Ngozi is in a better position to now build capacity for African countries or now to know the mechanism within WTO to take the advantage of trade, to re-energize our industries that have closed down, to also make sure that uh, we know how to, to participate in international trade without killing our own domestic industry. You know, and I think that's also very, very important. And our appointment is also coming under a pandemic now. And I think we have a crisis now. Don't forget that the major product now is vaccine. First, Dr. Ngozi, and I think she, she, she's supposed to have uh, vaccine holding. So she's in a better position to enforce the rule, to make sure that, yes, vaccine sovereignty doesn't mean that we will block access to other developing countries. But the one that is even of interest to me is that goods that we are producing and services in Africa. Like Africa should produce its own car, its own cars, its own textile, its own uh, petro uh, petrochemical products so that we can also export abroad and then in turn create jobs for our citizens. In fact, one of the things that killed textile industry was the way we went to world trading organization. The way uh, Dr. Ngozi has spoken, I think there will be more partnership now between WTO as well as with ILO, with UNDP, so that we all link all those sustainable development goals of eradicating poverty, of creating jobs, of encouraging innovation, uh, of allow for women empowerment, we link it to trade. So that it's not trade for trading state, but trade for development. Thank, Thank you very you so much, much for your time. We do appreciate. And that's all we can take on today's edition of the program. Join us next week for a fresh edition of the show. I am Sharon Ijasson. Thanks for watching and remember that labor creates wealth.